A key source of support for President Trump comes from the white evangelical community of Christians. Reverend Robert Schenck is a clergyman from that very group. And after some deep self-reflection, he changed his mind on some of the so-called culture war issues and regrets his often divisive rhetoric at the time. He now leads an educational nonprofit which takes inspiration from the anti-Nazi dissident Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was executed for plotting against Hitler. Here he is now talking to our Michel Martin about embracing empathy in these turbulent times. You, along with Pat Robertson, are one of the very few white evangelicals to criticize the president for this at a time when there's obviously great unhappiness, anxiety, and grief uh, in the country. Why do you think that is? I think first it points to the moral collapse in my own religious community. Among my fellows, uh, there was a Faustian deal made with Donald Trump, which went something like this. Uh, Donald Trump promised, I will give you everything you've ever wanted on your laundry list of political deliverables if you give me what I want and demand, and that is religious cover. I need you to say that I'm blessed of God and that everything I've done is good. He defended the photo uh, in front of St. John's Church with the Bible by saying a lot of Christians think it's a great photo. And that's what he needs in the deal. And we made that deal with him. And uh, so there's a moral vacuum. There's an inability to muster the moral courage to stand up to this. I was delighted to see what Pat Robertson said. The fact that he did speak out was terribly important, though a little late in the game, uh, but he did. But my other colleagues uh, have not been able to do that for a number of reasons. One is because they would be assailed by their own constituents now for doing so. But the other is they would lose access, instant access. They know that Donald Trump will throw them under the bus, will lock them out of the White House, will uh, insult them and disown them in an instant if they displease him. They are aware of that. And so they have to play uh, this game very, very carefully. They're on very thin ice. They want uh, what they still have outstanding on the list, which is a final appointment to the Supreme Court to give them a, a rock solid conservative majority. They're not gonna let anything endanger that, even this kind of supremely offensive behavior. I, my reading of this is this isn't just a leader issue. This is a followership issue. There is something about Mr. Trump that seems to be deeply attracted to white evangelicals. What is that? Well, leaders on every level, uh, from including the president, uh, but certainly among evangelical leaders, tend to reinforce sometimes what is best in us, but often what is worst in us. And in this case, there's an opportunity for evangelical leaders uh, to face what is really happening in our country, ask the question, what kind of spiritual family, of religious movement, of identification do we want to have? And uh, we always win when we go with those who are oppressed and marginalized and see it from their vantage point that was certainly true of early evangelicalism uh, when we championed the poor and uh, we built hospitals and schools and uh, took care of uh, those who were forgotten uh, in society. When we did those things, we grew as a movement. Now, we are losing millions and millions of especially young people. And right now, the future of American evangelicalism is bleak. I do know that the Southern Baptist Convention just had their convention. It is the nation's largest Protestant denomination, and they show a membership decline. It's the 13th straight year of decline. It's the largest single year decline in more than a century. What are you seeing? And that's true almost across the board, and especially when you look at under age 45. And the younger, the worse the statistics become. Young people especially are leaving evangelical churches in droves. And why? 
because they see the hypocrisy, they see uh, an identification with establishment power, with political force and influence. They are tired of the combat, the uh, social conflict, the uh, wars, uh, many of them ginned up. Look, I know this stuff personally. Uh, I battled with fundraisers for decades who told me, uh, look, we need to leave your people afraid and angry. Mm -hmm. The madder they are, the more fearful they are, the more money they're going to send you. Give us more fear and more anger. I was actually told that explicitly at a conference room table. We need more fear and more anger. Well, young people are sick of that. You've had some significant breaks with others in the evangelical movement uh, over the years now. I mean, you've broken with them on the issue of expansive gun rights. You've broken with them around the issue of how abortion should be discussed and thought of a sort of a number of issues. And I can imagine that you know, some people would say you're the wrong one. I mean, you're the outlier. You're the one who's getting it wrong. And in fact, some people would might argue that your point of view is dangerous, that you're imperiling people's souls. And I just wondered how you have reconciled yourself to this, you know, over the years. What convinces you and affirms you in your view that your path here is the path that really others should be taking? Humbly, I would say. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been anything but easy. Uh, including internally. Uh, it's been a very difficult journey for me, but it started by facing myself, and that was a terrifying thing to do, to listen to my own words and to watch their effect on other people, on the other person, instead of constantly listening so that I would feel better about myself. I started listening to hear the effect of my words on others. That was part of that process of change. But I'm not alone. There's a book out now called The Spiritual Danger of Donald Trump in which 30 top level, some of the best uh, evangelical hearts and minds in the United States writing essays, warning of why the Trump culture, not necessarily Donald Trump as an individual human being, but the political and social culture that Donald Trump, Trump represents and fosters is so dangerous, particularly to Christians. And I go back to, again, what, what is our message? What, what, what are we trying to proclaim and live out? And if I look at the model of Jesus, and if evangelicalism is anything, it's Jesus-centered. We call it, in theological speak, being Christocentric. Jesus Christ being at the center of everything we say, do, believe, proclaim, practice, all of it. The centrality is Jesus Christ. He becomes the model. Too many Christians uh, segregate the world. We are segregationists into the saved and the lost. Those who know God, those mm -hmm. who don't. Those who are sinners, those who are saved and sanctified. Well, that's not the way Jesus treated people. He treated every human being with precisely the same love, respect, and dignity. And that's the heart of the gospel. So for me, this is all about returning to my original faith, not renouncing my faith. What, what, what's the way forward here? I mean, we're in a moment in which um, there is just a lot of anger and tension in the streets. It's a big sea change. I mean, the fact that you've got some sort of figures who had previously been extremely dismissive of some of the social movements like Black Lives Matter and so forth, who have been very dismissive or critical of them. You're, you're now seeing them say, you know what, I'm thinking about this and I'm seeing something here and I think you were right and I was wrong. That's, that's kind of new. So what's the way forward here in, in your view? Well, in fact, we just had a number of evangelical leaders in the uh, white evangelical leaders in the Washington, D.C. area march with the Black Lives Matters uh, folks in the streets. It was beautiful to see. And then I just participated in a wonderful 
uh, prayerful, Bible-centered celebration at St. John's Church where President Trump, uh, you know, had that photo op and held up the Bible. Only this time, the Bible was actually opened, read, preached, and there were the prayers of thousands of people, and it was uh, people of many faiths came. What is the way forward? I think first for white evangelicals, especially those of a certain age like me, to maybe preach less, speak fewer words, listen more deeply and much longer and put ourselves as much as possible, we can never do it perfectly, but as much as we can put ourselves into the experience of another person, sit there prayerfully, reflectively for a, a while, maybe for a long while, and feel what they feel. We see Jesus do that on a number of occasions, even to the point where when one of his friends died, he stood at the, the entryway to the tomb and wept. It's one of the most profound but shortest verses in the entire Bible. Jesus wept. That's all it said. Maybe this is a time for us to stop talking like I'm doing now and instead weep with those as the scripture commands us to do. Weep with those who weep. We are citizens of cities. We are citizens of countries. But together, we are citizens of the world.